The rise of finance influencers, or finfluencers as we creatively call them, over the last few years has been nothing short of stunning. With lockdowns, meme stock rallies, general NFT and cryptocurrency euphoria of 2021, it really felt like we saw the floodgates open. With enthusiasts and even already established influencers rushing to post content online about finance and investing and how to make money in the markets. And to an extent, it was a great thing to see all this new open discussion about what's clearly an important topic. But during this explosion of content, a lot of ugly stuff started to come to the surface. Analysis videos that hype up positions and gloss over the significant risks. What if I told you there's a project guaranteed to increase in price? Get rich quick clickbait videos that exaggerate what uh, investing will do for you. Making millions of dollars in crypto is not rocket science. Promotions of shady crypto projects, trading courses, discord groups, and of course, unregistered crypto platforms. With creators more than happy to tell their viewers what they should invest in, all while highlighting that this is not financial advice since that's a regulated activity that comes with liability. But this content still influences people's financial decisions. It's in the name, which matters because as we saw with the collapse of FTX and BlockFi in 2022, it can cost people dearly. But while it's been over a year since those events caused a bit of backlash for influencers online, we've since seen Bitcoin touch a new all time high, leading to a resurgence in meme coins and some of the questionable activities of the finfluencer space, which raises the question, what to do with Finfluencers? Well, a recent report released from the Chartered Financial Analyst or CFA Institute discusses just that. With researchers analyzing top search results across TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram for common search terms to provide a better understanding of what Finfluencer content looks like, the risks presented by it, and what to do about it. And it presents an opportunity to go over some interesting insights and coalesce everything we've talked about regarding this subject into a single, hopefully productive video so that we can better understand Finfluencer content and where we can take it from here. Because that's actually the first point I want to touch on. While someone who's seen the worst of the worst here might be convinced that we need to burn it all down, it's not all bad. In North America, financial literacy is depressingly low. One Ipsos survey found that over one third of Americans self-identify as financially illiterate, whereas a National Canadian survey found likewise that over one third of respondents failed to correctly answer more than two of five basic financial literacy questions. It's no surprise then, given this gap in financial education, that many have turned to Finfluencers to try and address this shortcoming. Compared to hiring a financial advisor or enrolling in a formal financial course, Finfluencers often offer free content that can be accessed anytime. Not to mention, online personalities usually come across as more honest and relatable. And quite frankly, it's a heck of a lot more engaging than a meeting with an advisor about your budget or risk management. And because of this, according to the CFA report, roughly half of Gen Zers in Canada and the United States use social media to learn about finance, with unregulated assets like cryptocurrencies being a particularly popular subject given that this information is not as readily available through traditional outlets. And while there are certainly some concerns around the quality of information, Finfluencers have cemented themselves as a resource for younger generations, with 30 to 51% of Gen Z investors, depending on the country, citing social media influencers as a major factor in their decision to start investing. It touches on the positive impact that Finfluencers can have. And the good news is, it's not all just yellow stock picks being shared here. In analyzing 110 search results for beginner information across YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram, the CFA report found that Finfluencers do commonly promote good practices, like saving an emergency fund and paying off high interest debt before investing, warning viewers about the risks of stock picking, promoting sound investment principles like diversifying and investing for the long term, and even highlighting the limitations of their own content. Most sources also focused on promoting index investing and ETFs, which while only one style of investing, are generally considered cheap and well diversified, making it a more appropriate approach for a beginner than yellowing your life savings into Shiba Inu coin. So clearly, Finfluencers can be a force for good and have in instances had a positive impact on their viewers. And when handled responsibly, Finfluence, for lack of a better word, can absolutely help individuals get on the right path with their finances. When it's not handled responsibly, however, we start to run into some problems. 
I don't need to tell you that the internet has been a very empowering tool, and these days, social media has enabled anyone with a camera and a Robinhood account to start sharing advice online. A key drawback from this, however, is that these days, anyone with a camera and a Robinhood account can start sharing advice online. One report by Dutch regulator AFM found that of 150 influencers studied, none of them were licensed by the AFM to provide investment recommendations, and many did not complete a relevant finance degree or have any work experience in the finance sector. Now, of course, just because someone isn't formally educated on the topic of finance doesn't mean they can't share valuable insights or their own experience on a topic that we all have to deal with. We shouldn't gatekeep discussion around finance any more than we should around diet or fitness. But in consuming content online, it can often be difficult to ascertain whether someone is truly a subject matter expert or just someone sharing their opinions, which gives rise to the first risk highlighted by the CFA report, the misinterpretation of a Finfluencer's level of expertise. The CFA report found that roughly a third of content analyzed provided explicit investment recommendations telling viewers how to handle their money. Only 20% of these recommendation videos offered any sort of disclosure around the creator's regulatory status, experience, or conflicts of interest. This makes judging the quality of the information you're seeing online quite difficult, and often leads audiences to use proxies of expertise, rather than a creator's actual resume, to judge the information's reliability. Things like, according to one Gen Z focus group, a creator subscriber count. Now, other factors cited included transparency and motivations, which obviously do matter, but none of these are inherently representative of someone's degree of finance expertise. And in instances where a creator lacks the practical experience, expertise, and education, we've often seen them supplement these things with something a bit more flashy. Flexing. Dave, give me that crown, get in my way and you'll be put down. It ain't your place, all this my time. I want that shit that'll get it right now. I'm losing it, the noose if it's some loose shit, the stupid myth you choose to live or choose to dip. Now it makes sense why we would take the mental shortcut of judging someone's financial expertise based off the private jets or fast cars they show in their videos. But this is just an example of what's called attribute substitution, taking something that's difficult to judge, someone's level of financial prowess, and replacing it with something easier. Do they look like they have a bunch of money? Which isn't a perfect gauge. There's lots of ways to make money without technical finance know-how, like selling a day trading course. There's also the fact that it can be pretty easy to fake your wealth online. This isn't even my car. I rented it for a few hundred dollars. A bit of a waste for most people, but for Finfluencers, it's just a cost of marketing. Yeah, don't ask questions, shut your lid. Alternatively, some influencers haven't gained an audience by pretending to be a multi-millionaire expert, but because they come across as an everyday Joe, just trying to make it with their finances like you or I. This is especially true when it comes to things like meme coin cryptocurrencies and meme stocks, where supporters actively reject conventional finance wisdom and instead subscribe to a more speculative theory or belief that if we all do a certain thing, we're all going to make it. And if we get more people to buy it, the value goes up, right? If everyone holds, then yes, it could go that high. Unfortunately, while some influencers have really built their audience around these ideas and even become impromptu poster boys for these movements at times, they haven't often worked out. Take AMC, for example. Much like GameStop, it was a heavily shorted, struggling business that saw its stock price shoot up in value in early 2021, leading YouTubers like Trace Trades, who had made a massive bet on the position, to suddenly find themselves in the limelight, with Trey himself, in a way, becoming the leader of the so-called AMC Ape Army. They call themselves that, I didn't make that up. Trey continued to post trading videos and even showed up on news channels to discuss AMC, ultimately arguing that AMC was on the cusp of a massive short squeeze. That never happened. The stock is down 98% from its peak and even roughly 50% from before the meme stocks rally. And Trey's channel went radio silent on the topic. I decided to reach out and ask him what had happened. And he responded. As time passed and I learned more, I realized I was wrong about a lot of my understanding of the market and understanding of how retail influences things. The culture that I had helped create around AMC, in my opinion, was not a very healthy one. And when I stepped away from everything, I didn't know how to address that culture without ruining my image in other people's minds. I enlisted them so that I wasn't fueling more of the unhealthy understanding of the market that I unfortunately helped create. It's an example of how someone genuinely interested in sharing information and who believes in their thesis can still contribute to the next set of issues highlighted by the CFA inappropriate or poor quality information, including recommendations and misinformation. 
Even with the CFA report focusing on beginner videos, they still found Finfluencers who quote, encouraged potentially harmful behaviors. Videos, for example, that encouraged match betting over investing. Even suggesting quote, you don't need to know anything about sports. Others offer to teach viewers how to get rich the easy way. Creators also frequently position their content as quote, gateways to certain lifestyles that may appeal to aspirational values, highlighting investing as a means to participate in the consumption of high-end consumer goods, such as sports cars, or as a way to maximize leisure time. With one creator even suggesting that investing could be a way for young men to attract women. And to be clear, investing is an incredibly powerful tool, but it can only do so much. And that's just what the CFA report found when using beginner search terms like how to invest. Once you move past beginner videos, the not financial advice can get pretty wild. It's yeah. fucking ridiculous what she's saying. Prepare for a rainy day. It fucking don't rain here. Making 100k a year is not the hard. One million dollar price per Bitcoin is inevitable. 401ks are the worst investment on the planet. It'll yield me 19% per year. It's a really fun game that makes you money. Watch 2024, biggest crash is coming. And then buy as much XRP or Ripple as you can afford every single paycheck. I'm not telling you to do this, I'm not a financial advisor. You can just spread it across all these things right here and get a 50X, 20X, next two to three years. It's not just the lack of expertise contributing to all this junk food content. Social media itself incentivizes creators to make bold claims and use clickbait to grab viewers' attention, with creators playing on the viewers' fear of missing out on life-changing returns, or alternatively, their anxiety over the state of the economy. But as mentioned by the CFA report, one of the biggest conflicts of interest come from promotions. 36% of the content sources analyzed by the CFA report contained investment promotions, ranging from affiliate links to explicit sponsorships, with this percentage being as high as 76% for YouTube videos. Meanwhile, the Dutch regulator study we cited earlier found that of the 150 influencers analyzed, 50 offered courses, 17 offered self-authored books, and 24 provided trading signals despite the lack of education among the group. Only two of the influencers were found to provide objective and general information without related interests. Now, a creator having a promotion doesn't inherently make them nefarious, and I won't lambast a creator for trying to make a living from their content. But it's still a conflict of interest that can impair a creator's objectivity when it's in regard to the subject they're covering. Especially considering that over the last few years, we've seen companies pay creators to promote actual investments. On top of the more blatantly ridiculous promotions of risky cryptocurrencies by more mainstream celebrities and influencers, you've actually seen YouTubers pay to talk positively about publicly traded stocks. And you'll quickly see why this company is my top silver pick for 2023. With Dolly Varden, Lexton Mining Corp, Traction Uranium, and Kalanix Mines being just a few of the risky positions to have paid promotion campaigns. Based on the price charts, you can probably guess how that went for viewers. That itself deserves some criticism but it gets worse when creators try to obscure the fact that they were even paid in the first place, giving rise to the fourth risk highlighted by the report, hidden marketing. Roughly half of the videos with paid promotions analyzed in the CFA report didn't include any sort of disclosure, with those that did frequently including generic disclosures that didn't fully identify the partnering service. And there are countless examples of creators being accused of promoting individual stocks and cryptocurrencies without disclosing the payment, presenting the positive coverage as their own objective analysis. And while an imperfect disclosure could be chalked up to someone not knowing any better about the laws and what's required, a lot of the time, it's because the creator knows it's a bad look. Remember Trey from earlier? Well, back in early 2021, he was accused of doing an undisclosed stock promotion for microcap stock ZK International, since he and a few other YouTubers happened to post positive videos about the stock around the same time. We got some pretty, uh, pretty positive sentiment towards this company. I am gonna be taking a position here. During our conversation, I asked Trey about ZK International. Here's his response. I did cover it and was paid and did not disclose that, correct was a bit desperate to solve some short-term problems, so accepted the sponsorship. As I'd mentioned earlier, I cared a lot about what people thought, so opted not to disclose, which was obviously wrong. As damning as that is, it's an honest perspective on why creators would opt to obscure when they are being paid, and why you need to be careful taking anything you see online at face value. Which brings us to the final risk highlighted by the CFA report. Scams. 
Social media in general is rife with scams, with the FTC highlighting that one in four people who reported losing money to fraud since 2021 said it started on social media. But this is a particular problem in the finance space, given that most people who are watching are explicitly looking for ideas of where to put their money. In late 2022, for example, the SEC charged eight individuals for running stock manipulation schemes across Discord and Twitter, while ex-crypto investigator Zach XBT has frequently released posts alleging to show pump and dump and other fraudulent activity among crypto influencers, demonstrating that, unfortunately, some creators explicitly use their influence to scam their viewers. There are also a lot of scams around trading courses and Discord groups, with creators often hyping these things up as life-changing products that will help you get rich, Whereas in actuality, as demonstrated by a lawsuit from the FTC against Warrior Trading, it's quite common for people to actually lose money with these programs, especially after accounting for their hefty signup fees. Which is really one of the oldest scams in the book, because if someone really did have an investment product or course or trading strategy that did make them millions of dollars without any effort, they wouldn't need to sell you a course on it. They would just be making millions using their strategy. You can really see why the finance space online has become a breeding ground for bad advice, uh, with all the sources of poor quality information and the seemingly endless line of conflicts of interest. But oftentimes when discussing really any of these points, I've come across the argument of, so what? So what if someone tells their massive audience that they should put all their money into Dogecoin 2.0 or takes money to promote something that ends up falling in value? They say it themselves. This is not financial advice. The audience needs to take responsibility. And to an extent, I can agree with that last point, especially in the age of AI videos and impersonation. The audience is going to have to build up a base level of resilience to this sort of content. God bless my money printer. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be critical or hold people accountable for the less than illegal stuff. Because as we've seen, audiences aren't always equipped to properly and rationally evaluate financial opportunities. For example, the CFA report found that some videos explicitly targeted younger audiences, with titles like How to Invest in Stocks for Teenagers 2023, Investing Advice for Teenagers, and Please Do This Now, You Won't Regret It and You'll Thank Me Later, Check Comments, Hashtag Investing, Hashtag Building Wealth, Hashtag Investing for Beginners, Hashtag Investing for Teens, Hashtag Financial Literacy, Hashtag Wealthy, Hashtag Successful. That last video was actually pretty tame, but nonetheless, it's clearly targeting an impressionable crowd, which matters because it's a more susceptible audience to bad financial advice. In fact, according to a recent Deloitte survey, Gen Zers are three times more likely to fall for an online scam than baby boomers. They're also members of the audience who are undereducated or in desperate financial situations, both of which can make them more likely to trust and follow the not financial advice provided by Finfluencers online. And that matters because personal finance and investing are incredibly sensitive subject areas. It's why financial advice requires registration in the first place. Like medicine, you're playing with someone's quality of life when you give a recommendation or suggest a course of action. So it matters when people overhype a position or promote a risky service they wouldn't use themselves because it convinces the audience to gamble money in what's already a risky endeavor under the guise of following a prudent and well thought out investment recommendation. And I understand traditional finance comes with its own imperfections and none of this absolves the conflicts of interest that exist even among registered professionals at times. But if we have problems with regulated financial advice, you can imagine the issues that arise when you remove whatever safety nets do exist. Which brings us back to the question, what to do with Finfluencers? Despite all the downsides I've highlighted, I don't think the solution is to ban the discussion of finance or investing online. I agree that bad apples will always exist and being able to share information freely about investing in finance is important and has been a positive development we've seen. So how do we maintain the benefits that come with openly being able to discuss finance while reining in some of the less than savory stuff? Well, the CFA report makes a couple of recommendations on this front. Number one, implementing a more universal definition of an investment recommendation across markets. Number two, educate influencers on regulated activities, encourage disclosures around conflicts of interest, and require regulatory status disclosures. And three, keeping records and publicly reporting data on complaints and whistleblowing activities regarding influencers. 
To the first point, the CFA noted that a lot of different markets define financial advice differently when it comes to whether something is a registered activity or not. US law, for example, lists explicit compensation as a requirement for something to be considered an investment recommendation, whereas the EU and UK don't hold the same condition. The CFA report also highlighted that regulations around cryptocurrencies are particularly patchy, leaving more room for shenanigans there, and a lot to be desired on a regulatory front. Meanwhile, the second and third points are actually moves that would better align Finfluencers with current investment professionals. Registered advisors face legal recourse if they don't disclose certain conflicts of interest to their clients, and likewise are currently listed on public databases alongside any past complaints. If you want to work with a professional, I highly recommend you check them out beforehand to look up their credentials and any past disclosures they need to make. But having a similar database for Finfluencer complaints would be helpful given that a lot of creators often just delete their problematic videos once it comes out that it might be getting them in trouble. Meanwhile, the CFA report speculates that most creators are genuine in their desire to educate and may simply not be aware of the issues their content can cause which is why engaging with Finfluencers could help regulators achieve better adherence to the boundaries around financial advice. The CFA report also makes recommendations for social media platforms and advertising firms, essentially suggesting that they better monitor Finfluencer activity to ensure proper disclosure and compliance. And thankfully, we have seen a crackdown in certain markets on financial advice provided online. In 2021, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission introduced guidance for Finfluencers, highlighting that anything beyond factually describing an investment product or service could actually lead to jail time for unregistered Finfluencers. India's regulatory body has likewise started to make moves towards better regulating Finfluencer activity. And on the flip side, we've even seen regulators hold some platforms accountable, with the CFA report highlighting a case where the UK Financial Conduct Authority banned brokerage free trade from paid for social media posts because one of their partnering Finfluencers implied to their audience that investing could help viewers pay off their debts. Meanwhile, platforms like TikTok have explicitly banned the promotion of financial services, while Meta has likewise banned promoting certain financial products and requires their written approval for promoting certain cryptocurrencies. Albeit I'll acknowledge that that activity still happens on both platforms. But that touches on the point that these actions can only do so much. And at the end of the day, the viewer will always be the best line of defense against bad online advice. On this note, the CFA even makes recommendations for educators in terms of helping to improve financial literacy. But I want to highlight the three criteria they include for viewers to use when evaluating Finfluencer content. The first is motivations. Does the person slash source who has created this content have any financial motivation to do so? Does the individual clearly disclose such motivations? Secondly, qualifications. Does the person provide any information about what qualifies him or her to have expertise on this topic? Can this information be verified? And third, consistency. Is the information provided consistent with most up-to-date information when cross-checked with other sources? I think this provides an awesome summary of how viewers can critically analyze not just finance information, but really anything they consume online. No one acts in your best interest better than, well, you. And I know the parasocial relationship is this really weird thing we develop with creators, but Finfluencers are not your friends. Sorry you had to find out about us this way. But if you do need to lean on others for financial guidance, you should take everything you hear online with a grain of salt. The more specialized the information and the more explicit the advice being provided, the more critical you should be of the creator's content and their expertise. And of course, I'll always encourage people seeking out explicit advice and who have the ability to do so to seek out a professional. And there, yes, I do have my own bias given that I work in the industry, but financial advice should be tailored to a person's unique financial situation. That's not to say you shouldn't research the questions you have, and you should certainly hold a financial advisor to a higher standard, considering their credibility and their own past complaints. But in dealing with the risky nature of investing, you'll at least get those guardrails that have been put in place in dealing with a professional. With all I've covered, I really don't wanna be in my ivory tower talking down to the peasants and my fellow creators. But I think we need to talk about the risks of the space and encourage more skepticism across audiences, even for my own videos. And I don't wanna unfairly nitpick against creators who disagree with me or might do things differently. Not every small transgression means a Finfluencer has nefarious intentions. Not everyone who makes a wrong call about an investment or who sells a course is inherently a scammer. And of course, there's room for amateur videos. Sharing experiences and even amateur analysis can still be incredibly productive, so long as creators are honest about their level of expertise and the risk involved 
and don't misrepresent the opportunities becoming overconfident in the ability to make someone rich. I also want to try and end all this on a more positive note. I've been very negative today and I generally don't like that. Uh, so I want to highlight some creators, other finfluencers, if you will, that I think are doing an awesome job sharing information online. Two Cents, for example, is a great one I'll highlight for beginners. They're a PBS back channel run by two financial planners who cover an array of personal finance concepts. They're US based, but most of their videos can broadly apply to any market. Meanwhile, if you're past more of the basic stuff, Aswath Damodaran is an NYU professor who posts free finance university courses on his YouTube channel. For him, I definitely recommend navigating his videos using the playlists. Finally, while I've only seen a few of their videos, The Money Guys Show seems to be a solid resource for all sorts of finance related concepts. Of course, there are plenty of other great channels, but these are some great education focused starting points for anyone looking to learn more about personal finance or how to invest. I'll also include some resources in the description below you can check out, including some online courses. They're free to take. And no, I wasn't paid to promote them. Hopefully this all shows that when it comes to content online, there's a lot of stuff that can be learned from Finfluencers and that should be celebrated. But whether it comes from my own videos or Joe Blow Trades 3000, you need to be critical of everything you hear. Most people are genuinely interested in providing helpful information. And I really hope we see more of a movement away from this more toxic clickbaity and honestly just get rich quick stuff. But until we do, until we see more changes, perhaps at the regulatory or even the platform level, as always, be safe out there.